want to talk to you a bit about why veterans. Uh, 40 years I've been a priest of the church, and every parish I served, uh, when I had the first th November I was there, asked veterans to stand up and be recognized by the congregation, and in every one of those congregations, the first time that it ever happened. And there's that, and so I thought, you know, something's got to change around here. We talked to the Brotherhood chapter at Peter and Paul in Marietta, Georgia, and from that conversation, there was a, a desire to do something to better incorporate and welcome veterans uh, to to deal with some of the needs because Georgia has a, a sixth largest population of veterans in the country, and we're not the sixth largest state, but we are for veterans. And so we started Care for the Troops, and. The, the, this is an image I use a lot with uh, when I talk to, to veterans groups, and that is how do you find gold? And panning for gold means you have to kind of look for it. You have to be patient with it, and you have to sift a lot of mud out of the way. <laughs> but you do find gold, and that's what's valuable. So what's so good about veterans? Well, most, most congregations already have a lot of veterans in your midst. You have somebody in one of these categories. Whether you recognize them or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you say anything to them or not, then they very well may be in leadership groups uh, within your congregation. Here's what they bring to the table. Veterans are taught to place others before self. So they, wouldn't, they wouldn't go into battle to fight and kill. They go into battle to protect us at home. So they're putting themselves in a, in a subservient part to to the rest of the population. They have extreme loyalty to the unit. And as I thought through uh, and worked with that brotherhood chapter in, in Marietta, I thought, now that's the kind of men I would like to have in my parish. They were extremely loyal to the parish, to their, to their savior, and to the work of the church. They have great perseverance in, in adversity. They lead well, they follow well. They adapt to changing leadership rather quickly because in the military you have to. They adapt to changing environments because, again, in, when you're downrange, the environment changes moment by moment sometimes. They have great situational awareness, so they wouldn't be veterans, they would be buried. <laughs> right? And uh, they have broad world view because they've been to a lot of places around the world. They've seen extreme poverty, they've seen extreme wealth, they've seen good people, they've seen bad people, they've seen a lot of stuff, and they bring that back with them. And they have a wide range of skills, everything from various trades up to strategic planning. And what parish could use men who know these things and who bring this to the table? So that's why, why I'm so big on saying let's not only welcome them, but let's identify them and bring them into leadership positions. They do have troubles. Well, who doesn't? And here are the things that we know about. Multiple deployments recently, 1% of the American population goes in the uniform. One third of those get deployed into harm's way. So it's a tiny percentage of the population, but we all know from just paying attention that in the, since 9-11, uh, some have been uh, downrange five, four, five, six times for anywhere from six months to 18 months at a time. They have family separation, and a difference about military members and the normal civilian, when the families are separated in the civilian worlds because they're mad at one another. In the military, they're separated because somebody got orders to go downrange, and unaccompanied. Uh, everybody who's been in a stressful situation has post-traumatic stress something or other. Sometimes you grow from it, sometimes we have difficulty making decisions afterwards, sometimes it goes all the way to dysfunction. But there's a, there are ways to arrest that. Some few get blown up and survive it and have traumatic brain injury uh, and other things. Moral injury is a big deal. When you see enough carnage around you, when you've seen your friends die next to you and you wonder why it was that your, your buddy, who's obviously better than you are, instead of yourself, then you come home with moral injury. And the church, of all places, is the place to find remedy for that. Uh, and, and any time we're deployed out and moved every few years, then there's impact on families. Uh, we all know about suicide and suicidal ideation. Uh, when I was on the task force, it was the DOD had been, upset, uh, had been concerned about it for a number of years and was tracking it fairly closely and doing everything they get, could to turn it around because it was almost as high as the civilian rate for the same demographics. 
It's not that it was out of hand in the population, but it was getting up close to the rate for civilians. And what we fail to recognize is suicide is a national epidemic. It affects every population. There are significant portions that it affects more than others. Young men. And what does the military have? Young men. Um, so there's that. There's also addiction to alcoholism, all this other sort of stuff, and sexual trauma, and, and difficulty accessing medical care, and unemployment, underemployment, and homelessness, all of which civilians also have to deal with. And all of which churches and synagogues around the country are having have ministries to help our, their members get through them. And so adding a military focus to, every, to ministries you already have shouldn't be that big of a leap. Plus you get all the benefits of all the, all the value they bring to the table. So, and when we started talking about this at, down at, in Marietta, Georgia, uh, then this is how it developed. We wanted a, min a ministry that was addressed to the military and their extended family members uh, to raise the awareness of the congregation that they were there already and to create an environment of acceptance so that people would not only recognize them but welcome them into ministry and into leadership within the congregation. On the website, carefortheTroops.org, there's a what a 50 some odd page handbook right now that's just a compilation of things that congregations around the country have added to this is what we do and so we put it in there this is open access it's in PDF it's in Word and there are a couple of copies here uh, that you can look at but you also will have a, a, a web address where you can go look at it yourself we, we, did, we deliberately do not copyright, copyright our work because we want people to act and not ask permission you know, get forgiveness later. Okay, a veteran-friendly congregation is one that makes a commitment to welcome, utilize, care for veterans, military members, veterans, and their families. That's it. And how you decide to do that uh, is uh, to be recognized by Care for the Truth with a nice little certificate that you can hang in the narthex, is to do up to three ministries that are specifically focused about uh, military ministry and to let people know it's there. It takes a lot of word of mouth to get the word out. For everything from just welcoming people on Veterans Day and remembering those who died in service on Memorial Day to allowing the local vet center to have group therapy in the church. All kinds of things you can do. There's, like I said, it's a lot of pages. And then to let, let the word out. And then once a year to renew the commitment, it doesn't cost you anything. We do not charge for this. We're an all-voluntary organization. None of us get paid to do this. Uh, and you don't have to behave like anybody else. You can set your own standards. You can, you can approach it your own way. Here's where we are. We started in Georgia. And then we started moving out of Georgia into others, to a neighboring state. And then we jumped up to... Boston and out to Sacramento and so I think there's one in Alaska, right? Billy? Yeah, one in Alaska, but it's not on the map. Sun City, Arizona. Sun City, yep. Yeah, right here. So we're jumping over states now and, and uh, there's again, this is what we will do is to provide you free of charge for them with the manual. What we'll do is send you a certificate so you can hang it in the narthex and let people know that that you welcome military members, veterans, and their families into your congregation. And then you can do other things. We, we, had, we got one of those little, tiny little flag displays with the service flags on it, put it on the table in the narthex with a, memor with a memory, book, memory and prayer book. So that if somebody, had a, somebody died in the service at any, any conflict, their names would be in the prayers of the departed. If they had a family member or a close friend is serving currently, they could put it over in the, in the uh, intercessory prayer section, and then we would include those in the prayers for the people. So it's just it's a subtle thing. It raises an awareness, and, it, and very gradually people recognize that they are actually welcome and valued. So what we're asking you to do today is take that sheet of paper that was passed out earlier, 
Uh, if you're not a rector, if you are a rector, sign and send it in. If you're not a rector, talk to your rector, your vestry, whoever need the head of the altar guild, whoever runs the place, and uh, and say, look, we need to do this because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and and then to to send it into our hit in our headquarters in Marietta, and to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And then let us put your little tab up there on our map and list the congregation. This is not just an Episcopal Church thing. We've got Methodists and Lutherans and Baptists. Uh, we've got a rabbi talking to us now uh, that wants to get something started in the Reformed Jewish community. We've got all kinds of folks. The important thing to us is if you've got military members, veterans of your families in your congregation or in your area that you reach out to them and serve them who have served you. Um, and you'll need a, somebody, a layperson, to lead it. Don't, don't give it to the vestry. They get lost in committee. Uh, a brotherhood member is the best person I can think of uh, to do it. Perhaps a veteran or somebody who's related to a veteran uh, and has a little fire in their belly about making this happen in your place. Uh, and then... You know, if if it, if you find that it's beneficial to your congregation, spread it. Take it to your bishops. Distribute it around the, around your diocese, in your province, uh, a general convention, anywhere in your ministerial association with all those other people uh, who also worship our Lord somewhere in your community, and and make this country welcome welcoming to this population, and, which is so important to our survival as a country. Now, you can find everything I just said, first of all, in your little blue bags that were handed to you today. All the slides are there. If you go to the web page, which is carefortheTroops.org, I know you have to type a lot. Why does this keep changing? And right over here, if you click on that, you'll have everything we've talked about. The handbook is there. The slide presentation is there. The Federal Friendly Congregation letter is there. And a whole bunch of other stuff. And, uh, and you can investigate it to your heart's content. If you have any questions, get in touch with us in Atlanta, Billy Harrison, John, me, any of us down, down in that area, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Now, since I was given a limited amount of time and then it got eaten up by all the caterwauling, uh, <laughs> Tom, Martin, Tom Martin was in that same brotherhood group down there. He tries to shorten my time all the time. Anyway, uh, so I'll, I'll answer any questions you may have and then pass it off to the next speaker. Yes, sir? I think it might be interesting just to find out how many veterans are in the room. Okay, how many How many are of your veterans? Holy cow. Okay, so you do, so you, most of you have a fire in your belly about caring for those behind us. How many of your Vietnam veterans? Vietnam veterans have a particular fire in their belly about welcoming the new post 9-11 veterans home because our welcome didn't come until they started being welcomed. It started in 1982 with the dedication memorial and got better for us. But we, but as a, it almost as a population without any coaching, the Vietnam veteran decided this new group has got to be treated better, it had to be treated more it had to be welcomed better back into our into our community. I'm one of the few Vietnam veterans that got welcomed home. Dinner at the White House and all that good stuff because I was I managed to live through a prison experience. So uh, so all you veterans you thought you've thought about this I know and so here's here's a mechanism for making it happen and help and bringing your church into the process of welcoming home. Yes? Yeah, we'll get this so you can get on. So, uh, you know, a lot of rectors have a whole lot on their plate. And uh, so what would you recommend as the biggest return on investment for them? And what would be the one program that would give the biggest return? Yeah, that's why I say a lay leader needs to be in charge of this. You want the rector to put his thumbprint on it because otherwise it probably won't happen. 
You might have to get the head of the altar guild to do the same thing. <laughs> Whoever screens people in your congregation. But if you go back to that early slide I said, what they bring to the table are men and women now who are willing to lead, to follow the lead, to stay with the program, to, to, to develop programs and ministries so that the, the rector's plate becomes less full. But you had on the one slide about the different types of programs you can institute. Decide which program to You decide any program you want. What, what do you think is the most effective one for the investment? There's 30 pages of those in there. <laughs> one doesn't stand up. Okay. Well, I wanted them on my vestry. Huh? I, I wanted veterans on the vestry who would actually work instead of sit around and vote on stuff and go home and not think about it for 30 days. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted veterans as head of the ushers. So instead of standing in the narthex talking to one another, they were standing in the narthex looking for people they didn't know so they could welcome them in. I wanted veterans who were in the pastoral care team because, uh, because they, would, they knew what it was to be injured and they would go and care for people. I wanted veterans who would do any of the work that's laid out there, would teach others, would, and, and I think they come with that skill that, that the themes of their skills are all the things I always look for. And translating the theme of their leadership into the, the reality of parish life was not that hard. And so when, when you look down, I'll just start brainstorming what it is, where you, what, what it is going on already that you need to go better. Ask what skill, what talent, what virtue does a veteran bring that can, can come in there? Or you can look at the most stressful thing on the rector's plate and say, how can we get that one off your plate? So that the rector can worry about liturgies and preaching and, and, and leading, leading the pastoral care ministries and the teaching ministries and not have to worry so much about whether or not the parking lot is broken. Remember a lot of our veterans are into when they go over overseas, they end up infrastructure work. The, the Corps of Engineers is about building roads, highways, schools, power plants, and so they come back with the skills to do that. They can take care of your facility. And a well-kept facility tells people that you love God. Yeah. All right? Your facility looks like you don't like it, people are not going to come in there. There was another question back here. All the way back, yes sir. Did you tell us where you get your funding from? Our fund, where, where do we get our funding? Billy, do we get funding? <laughs> Not much. Not much. Uh, for the training of, site, of, of licensed professional counselors, we got a grant from a therapy group called EMDR HAP uh, to teach the EMDR therapy, uh, which is one of, the, one of the tools in the VA and DOD toolkit for dealing with uh, post-traumatic stress. Uh, and we were able to do it that way. With the congregational piece, we don't, it doesn't cost us anything. We, so we, we did get some funding from the Diocese of, of uh, Atlanta. Uh, uh, the uh, Presiding Bishop's uh, Fund. And, uh, and our bishop asked all, excuse me, our bishop asked all uh, rectors to take their uh, collection from Veterans Day and send it to us, which, they, which many of them did. Uh, which was helpful really to help us get off the ground. And if I could just say something else about it. The main focus here for a veteran friend and congregation is to raise awareness of veterans. In our church, we have the, the little uh, display out front, but we also carry the American flag in the procession or recessional. We, we have veterans stand up on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. We also uh, our military ministry takes two Sundays uh, a year and does the coffee hour. And we spread the, t and on Veterans Day and Memorial Day, we spread the tables with patriotic things. Uh, and and we, we have a prayer, uh, we, we list all the veterans who are on active, active duty and in harm's way in our bulletin and pray for them by name uh, every service. So, I mean, these are just small things that you can do, and there are all kind of other small things you can do as a veteran-friendly conversation congregation to raise the awareness of veterans in your midst and veterans all around, which is what we're trying to do. Well said. Anything else? Gordon? 
I wanted to add one thing. Uh, one thing we we got instituted uh, when Father Roberts was our rector was the prayer for our country at every service. And we bring the American flag out to the congregation and we sing a prayer for our country. And I'm telling you what, I get goosebumps every single time I hear all of us sing. Uh, it, it, it was a tradition I remember when I was a kid, but the, it got lost over the years. And uh, thank you, Father Robert, for bringing that back. Well, that's page that's page 717 in the hymnal. That's the blue book. <laughs> it's the last, Fourth verse. It's the last verse. <laughs> last verse of God and our Father. No, there's well, two people. There's two people in your diocese that needs to know from the get-go that you're involved with this. The first person that needs to be told about this is your canon for congregational growth. That person needs to be on the get-go. Mine and my diocese is a member of the Brotherhood, and he was right there shoulder to shoulder with us. The second person that needs to be known is your bishop. Male or female, I don't care. They need to know that you're doing this. And when you get your certificate back from them, I'm taking my parish's certificate, which we just got this last week. I'm giving it to my bishop so that he can come and make a presentation or send a letter to my priest telling him how happy we are because we are now the anchor church for the Diocese of Kentucky and the Diocese of Lexington. And I would greatly appreciate or share your joy for seeing you go back home and be the anchor church in your diocese and involve your bishop. Because one of the things that I somebody told me was there these boys and girls coming home, 55 million of them are unchurched. That is a huge population, and that is a way for you to grow your local parish. Okay? And Father Robert, God love you. Thank you so much. Thank you. welcome to look at them uh, but all of this information is on the website carefortheTroops.org. and and one last thing I'd like to say I, I read this in the newspaper and I, I'm sorry I can't remember where it was on the editorial page so it's somebody's opinion but apparently the the country our country with its short attention span is starting to tire of welcoming veterans home we can't let that happen again, folks. Not like Vietnam. We cannot let that happen. And this is a good way to keep the, the sacrifices um, and the, the capabilities of our veterans in the forefront of our congregations.